16 years ago, we started Mighty Car Mods on a driveway in suburban Sydney. The show was tiny, a basic toolbox, a cheap camera, and some even cheaper cars. But with around 300 subscribers and a hunger for automotive adventure, we knew that we were onto something special. We put in thousands and thousands of hours into our little hobby, and over time, it grew and grew. We learned from the masters and honed our skills. From cheap modifications through to bigger budget builds, we worked with Hollywood film companies, big brands, and PlayStation franchises. We explored automotive cultures in countries all around the world, and most importantly, connected with millions of fans around the planet who love cars just as much as we do. But 16 years deep and a billion views across our channels, where do we go from here? What is the next step? And as we thought about this, we realized that the future of this show is right where it began. Simple, cheap, affordable cars that can be the platform for an amazing adventure. To go forward, we need to go back to the beginning. And it was while I was in this mindset that I found this Daihatsu on Marketplace for $3,000. The exact same model that started our show all those years ago. We decided to develop this car for a very special and unique purpose. I'd heard about an epic race that happens at the Sepang Formula One circuit in Malaysia. So we decided to assemble a team of friends and become the first Australian race team in history to enter the K-Car Global 24-hour endurance race. Our team will not be a group of professionals, but instead a group of mates. Isaac and Dave, who are regulars on the show, Ying, who loves small race cars more than anyone we've ever met, and Ebony, who we travelled to France with earlier in the year to experience the 24-hour race at Le Mans. Also on the team is Julian and Stacey. Originally from Malaysia, Stacey has worked with us for years in the MCM shop, and this will be her first time racing. James and Blake are our camera guys and fellow Nugget enthusiasts who are also coming along. Add the two of us and that makes eight drivers. The first thing we had to do was start developing our platform here in Australia to learn whatever we could about endurance racing, making a car last and working as a team. With the car as ready as we were going to be able to get it, we started training at a local track in Sydney. There were so many things we had to think about. Helmets, race suits, safety gear, communications, logging and diagnostics, as well as all the basic logistical things that a team of people need, including working out race registrations, travel and accommodation. We'd be self-funding all of this ourselves with no professional race team, so we'd have to undertake multiple roles ourselves. We'd be driving, but we'd also be our own mechanical team, our own production team, and Stacy would take lead as our race team manager. With little to no experience, we had to learn how to be a race team on the run and jump straight into the deep end going halfway across the globe to do it. The final step in our preparation was to pull apart our development car and pack everything that we'd need into a pile of suitcases at the maximum of 23 kilograms that's allowed on a plane and then buckle up for the trip of a lifetime to Malaysia. We have just arrived in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. It's very early in the morning and already 35 degrees. It is a JDM fest of Malaysian proportions. There is Daihatsu's, there's Perodua's, there's all them. sorts of crazy stuff here. We have come to the right place. But what we're most excited about is we're about to see a car that we bought off the internet. Sight unseen, of course, for the very first time. So good. Everybody, here it is. Look. The all new Mighty Car Mods, Perodua. Kalisa. This may look like a Daihatsu, but that's only because someone swapped the badges. Thanks to sky-high import taxes and the need for local manufacturing, Perodua remakes Japan's greatest hits and keeps making them, sometimes decades after the last one rolled off the production line in Kyoto. We never got the four-door version at home, but that's the only version that they get here. It's got a few updated bits and pieces, but otherwise it's nearly exactly the same as the Daihatsu Sior that we could buy in Australia in the late 90s and early 2000s. Except, over here, they've got no heater, because this is Malaysia and they don't need them. And now we've got two days to turn this into a race car with the stuff that's in these suitcases. So with endurance racing, you need a lot of parts, a lot of tools, a lot of support, and you need the car itself. We have basically none of those. We've got a couple of mates to help us and two suitcases. So we have a race car in a suitcase and that thing. Now, a number of these race teams are going to be shipping over cars, support, shipping containers, uh, but this is it. In these bags, we've got our wiring, we've got our parts, all of the stuff race that suits. we set up in Australia uh, in advance on our local little Daihatsu. Uh, it's all here, we've ripped it all out, and then we have 48 hours to put all of this into that. All right, first drive. Bog stock. In our little nugget. 
Looks like it might have lowering springs on it. It definitely has lowering springs because it rides like it does. <laughs> and those epic love heart wheels. The brakes feel absolutely terrible. Good. So they'll need to be addressed. Which way is... Oh, yep, this way. Great. Right. Like a big loop, I think. So familiar. Oh, it feels good. Feels all right. It feels like it. Uh, like when you drop the clutch there, it feels like it grips up quite well. Yeah, it also feels like it's got engine mounts that are <laughs> Wi-Fi. Taco's really handy, actually. But it feels like a Daihatsu Sior, doesn't it? Yeah. Like it really does. Let's head on back to Rab Garage, Martin. And uh, 48 hours. <laughs> That's all we 48 got. hours, we got to turn this into a race car. These kind of cars are everywhere in Malaysia. Cheap to buy, cheap to run, and they're practical. The aftermarket scene is enormous here also, with modified cars all over the place. Not to mention an abundance of half carts and second-hand parts that arrive in containers from Japan, as well as new parts made both here in Japan and in China. We picked up this Ferrojua a few weeks ago, and a few days ago, Julian and Stacy installed the mandatory roll cage that we must have to go racing. But otherwise, it's stock, and it's pretty tired. Much like home, people drive these until they wear out, and maintenance isn't always front of mind. We need to make it as reliable as possible so it will survive 24 hours on a racetrack, driving flat out against more than 40 other cars, many of which have had years of development and preparation by veteran teams of mechanics and experienced racing drivers. There's a few parts that we ordered in advance to get delivered to Rab Garage, but otherwise all we have are some basic tools, the parts we brought in our suitcases, and a team of mates to help try and get through this epic event. Raja, who's the owner of Rab Garage, has let us use his undercover space here. So we were before over on the street. We thought we were going to be pulling apart the, the car right then and there in the sun, but he's let us use this space, which is basically a back alley. There's cats here. There's a woman cutting up some chickens over there. Uh, and with our mates, this is where we'll be creating our race car. So I've put together a somewhat extensive list of stuff we have to do. There's a lot. Um, we probably even have to get the engine out, which is a big job in itself, but we have all this stuff that we have to do to pass scrutineering. If it's not done, they will not let us on the track. So we've only got a bit over a day. It's time to get into it. Today is Wednesday. Friday morning, the car has to be finished. Yep. Let's go. The first step is to jack up your car and put it on jack stands because there is no hoist in this part of town. So we are going old school. We're going to go through the car and see exactly what it is that we've bought, what can stay and what needs to go in the bin. It's going to be all hands on deck to get this car ready for race day. Kitty, more like see you later, your dog. We're just pumping it right now. We're like pulling it apart, giving this thing like a proper birthday. So everyone is just hands on deck. We're just going for it. We are standing in an alleyway in Shah Alam. It is cool by Malaysian standards, but extremely hot for anyone that's from Australia. Uh, the car's been where well, the guys are working on it. They're tearing it down right now. Uh, it looks very different than what it did an hour ago. So hopefully we get a lot of good progress today and tick some of the things off the whiteboard. We've got the loom out of the car so far. Uh, it's a little bit different to what I have. So I'm not quite sure how we're going to go with adapting what I've done versus what we have, but I will try and figure it out. This has been in planning for so long, years in fact, since I first found out about this particular endurance race. Then COVID happened and we couldn't go for years on end. So there's been a lot of planning and in my head I was hoping it would all work out. And so far, even though we're only a little way through, it's all happening the way I'd hoped. A lot of progress is being made. I'd say probably the most challenging thing so far is that one of us drove through a massive pile of uh, dog turd on the way here. And so 
Uh, it smells pretty bad in there. It's, uh, it is quite hot, quite steamy, but um, heaps of progress being made because there is a lot of talent in the room and uh, things are getting done. We borrowed this engine crane from the mechanics at the front of the shop to support the engine while we drop it out the front of the car on its K-frame. This is the opposite of the way these cars are assembled and it is the easiest way to do it. While the engine's being ripped out of the front, I'm going to sort out the inside of the car, installing the steering wheel, the dash, seat, belts and everything else that we'll need to pass scrutineering. It's been less than 90 minutes working on this nugget and uh, engine gearbox and subframe is now out but there is a lot to do. That's right, there's a lot of service items which are boring but necessary like our shafts and our boots are completely smashed which was the same as our development car in Australia as well, the exact same issues. We're going to remove the gearbox, we're going to get our flywheel machine, we've got a new clutch to go on and then the boys can attack this like Dave can do his wiring stuff, can do a bunch of servicing stuff, change our injectors, change our coils, new spark plugs, all that kind of stuff to give us the best possible chance. Brake upgrade as well or just service these ones? Brake upgrade. We actually were going to bring our ones from home, but you can't buy the discs here that we've been able to find. So we actually need to change plan and go to, it's like a Produa Myvi. Yeah, the next size uh, yes. up car. Uh, basically, it's a car that comes with bigger brakes from factory, which as we always say, is a great way of upgrading your totally. car because chances are it's probably going to be compliant. It's going to fit. Uh, so they'll probably need like a full service as well. So I'll pull apart. Uh, so we'll get onto that. And other than that, we just start attacking this and then, um, get under the wiring and the sensors as well. And the great thing about having it out in front of us now, instead of leaning over the engine bay, you can get to everything. You can pull these off and put our coilovers in, brakes can come off, shafts, everything. It just gets so much easier. At the endurance event, there are four different classes that the cars are grouped into. Class one are extensively modified. Think tube frame chassis, built engines. Class two is for turbo engines under 660cc. Class 3 is up to 850cc, but no turbos. And Class 4, which is the one we're in, is about unmodified drive lines, more or less stock with some safety and handling improvements, which is about all we'll be able to do with a suitcase full of parts. Only K cars are allowed to compete, and you can only swap engines in from other K cars, but the main limiting factor of the event is actually fuel. Each car only has a limited amount of fuel to use for the entire event, and if you're busted sneaking more fuel in, you will be disqualified. These regulations are an attempt to make the racing fun and fair, and it means that the most powerful car won't necessarily win if it burns through all its fuel. So there is some strategy involved. This here is the Haltech IC7 Dash that was in our Australian Daihatsu. Uh, we brought this over in our suitcase. This is all of the wiring and the loom that was also installed in our Australian car. Dave's just put that in, so now, this is ready to go in, so I can plug in this one here into the back. Actually, before I do that, I'm sure it fits, but I'm just going to make sure that this here is the same, and it is, and that's great. So I can plug that in, and then I'll also need to plug in uh, this here, which is our USB that lets us uh, access it. So plug all of that in, then that can go in, and then this whole dash trim piece can go back on the car. About a week ago, I got in touch with a guy in Malaysia who I've ordered parts from before for my own Daihatsu. Many factory parts which are no longer made in Japan are still available in Malaysia, and even with shipping included, they are pretty inexpensive. We're upgrading wear items like the clutch and brakes as the car will be driven hard for an entire 24 hours. Anything we pull off will get put in a box and taken with us to the track as spares. The cooling system looked like it was full of mud, probably because it was run on water rather than coolant, which has rust inhibitors in it, and it was likely left for a long time between services. I'm going to remove the thermostat and try and flush it out as best I can. Isaac's going to replace the timing belt and water pump, and Davey's going to make a few modifications to our wiring loom because it turns out this engine is slightly different to the Australian one. Meanwhile, I need to set up our dash and keypad. I just need a way of mounting our little keypad uh, to the centre of the car. Uh, how I mounted it in Australia was a bit too far away so that when you're in the harness, if you've got shorter arms, you can't reach. I was trying to do like a double din or a single din uh, piece of plastic, like a blanking plate. Uh, they don't have that, but they do have this, which is uh, Honda, the power of dreams. It's basically a uh, number plate uh, backing plate. So I'm gonna cut this to size, see if I can mount that in there and then get our switches on this. So things are slowing down, but we're still making some good progress. This is what normally happens. You get everything apart real fast, which is important. So you know what you've got. 
I know that the thermostat housing was toast. The thermostat itself was toast. The engine was full of sludge. So it managed to flush all that out, which is excellent. Now we're moving on to the other side of the engine where the water pump is. That doesn't look great. Uh, so we're gonna replace the water pump, which we did bring with us. Timing belt looks really new, but we're just gonna look at it and see if it requires a change or not. Uh, and then we can start to put it all back together. We're gonna put a new clutch in, put it back together, put it on the K-frame and put it back in the car. We're still a couple of hours off doing that, but we're getting close. Pulling the water pump out reveals even more dirt water. It's hard to say how long it would have run like this. Eventually the whole system would block up and probably overheat. We don't want to risk that on the track, so we're going to service the whole lot. Meanwhile, I'm making a mount for our switch pad using whatever I can find around the garage. We're in the monsoon season. You can probably hear the rain has begun. What I've created here is something that is absolute pure function. Uh, it works, it's in there, it's bolted in. Uh, all of our keypad stuff will work. This here is the backing of a number plate plastic backing. There's a little bit of flex in it, but purely functional. I'm calling that job done. A couple of weird things I've found so far in Malaysia, they don't have tin snips, and we asked them for a pry bar, and they did not know what we were talking about. They're like, we don't have those in Malaysia. So just, yeah differences that you wouldn't expect. And so this here was created with um, an angle grinder and a pair of scissors that we borrowed from the office shop next door. It's all hands on deck and some hands on shoulders to get these mods done in time. We've broken into two teams, one dealing with the engine and mechanical things and the other installing our coilover suspension. This will make the car stiffer and less prone to body roll, something you do not want on a racetrack. Our clutch goes in without too much fuss and while that's being bolted down, I'm taking the opportunity to give the engine a brake cleaner bar so any sealant we use later will stick properly. We've stripped off any old bushes that we can get replacements for and they should arrive later in the day. Everyone's feeling the pressure so a little team stretch session helps everyone get loosened up and ready for more hot, sweaty Perodua mods. Well everybody, uh, we've uh, got the gearbox back on, uh, but just having a look inside the engine here, <laughs> it is Jimny all over again. Just well. a bit of oil down the valves will fix that. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> but got a gasket kit which is great, so that can go in the bin, a new one can go on which will prevent us getting any leaks that just make a big mess, or have us fail scrutineering because we're leaking oil, which we also cannot have. We're making a lot of progress. Uh, it's very dirty, hot work. Basic tools. Uh, the, the main thing that's really like been mind blowing for me is just a real limitation to tools. There's one DAC, but not a whole lot of sockets to fit. Yeah. Not a whole lot of screwdrivers. So you don't need it. Like no you just, knives. With the, but what they do have is heaps of parts. Because for these cars, we've always had to make stuff. You just can't get it. Yeah. Whereas here, it's the opposite. You just go, oh, I need this custom part, and it's like, oh yeah, Johnny next door's got one. Here you go, bang. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, click. So you don't actually need as much custom made stuff. Uh, we've been at it though for about five hours now, five, I reckon. Hours, yep. uh, heaps of progress and we're hoping that by the end of today the engine's actually back in there and then we'll kick on again tomorrow. As we put the engine back together, we're replacing any serviceable parts like spark plugs, belts, gaskets and hoses. We've also got some bushes for the suspension and the shifter, but it looks a little different to the ones we've seen before. It turns out the four-door version of this car, which we don't get in Australia, has a completely different rear suspension setup. Is it any better than our Aussie cars? Well, I guess we'll find out. You know what this is? I've never seen that before. So it's like, uh, because car theft is so common in Malaysia, it's like an empty theft device. So you put a key in and it clips something around here and you can't get the car in gear at all. Oh, so it, it locks the gear lever? Yeah, you can't move the gear stick at all. And so someone adds that on, that's an aftermarket part? Yeah, it's like a, a factory option if you want your car oh, to be much Oh, it's a factory option? Safer. Yeah. Wow. So it's offered by Perodua for you too. Really? Yeah. Make we we don't get those in Australia. <laughs> That's crazy. We're pulling this apart because we've got ourselves a short shifter, which may not make the car any faster, but it means all the bushings are brand new. We also just picked up some wheels off Malaysian Facebook Marketplace, which we're getting fit up with some rubber at a local tyre shop. We think they're Buddy Club P1s, but can't be sure as replica wheels are a huge industry here in Malaysia. The sensors that we brought from home to work with the Haltech will give us the ability to log what's going on as the car does laps of the track and make sure that it's all working properly. Engine mounts are cheap and easy to replace, especially when the engine is out. 
Worn out ones are no fun on a racetrack as the engine can feel like it's trying to escape from the body as you power around corners. We've also got some reconditioned drive shafts to go in. Then we can put everything back into the K-frame and attempt to lift it back into the car from underneath and then bolt it in. The engine is in the car. I am smashed. That was one of the sweatiest, hottest days of my life. I'm very proud of what we've achieved though in that day uh, because the shop's about to shut, so we've got to get out of here and we'll be here the second they open tomorrow, waiting at the door to finish this off. We also only had power tools for probably 30% of the day and it's amazing how much you're just used to having yeah. your, yeah. Your, the, the Ryobi side deck and the normal DAC, yep. when you don't have those things, it just takes a long time to have to do everything yeah, by we're, hand. We're spoiled, but, um, but we got it done and I'm very, very happy. And everything's good. Like there's nothing else there we could have upgraded that we haven't or serviced. Let's go get some satay chicken. So keen. It is hot, it is early. We are back at Rab Garage. We only have a couple of hours to finish this car now because we need to get it rolling because we have to get it scrutinized. There's a bit of other stuff we're going to do in terms of like production tricky stuff which we'll show you but uh, we've got to get the suspension in, we've got to get the engine working, Dave's got to get the wiring done. We ha there's just heaps so we're going to smash straight into it. We may well have bitten off more than we can chew because in less than 24 hours we need to be at the circuit which is over an hour away ready to race and get the car scrutinized. We aren't chasing big power here, we just want reliability. And with the parts and people that we've brought, we really hope we'll be able to get it done. Pretty sure the loom is ready to go in now, so uh, we'll put it in and see, see how it all fits up. Being there's so many unknowns for us, we wanted maximum control over our engine and the car itself. There's extras here like lighting, power for our cameras, and of course logging, plus being able to alert any of the eight drivers if there's a problem while they're out on track which can be the difference between a working or exploded car and then losing the race. In advance, I ordered an exhaust system uh, from within Malaysia and got it delivered here. Also got some headers. All this stuff is really cheap, um, which is great for our car. So it looks like we have to weld the middle, but the rest of it should bolt on and they give you new hangers, which is excellent because ours are completely thrashed. Our old exhaust doesn't look... No, it looks bad. <laughs> this is better. This is bigger. This is two inch and the old one was probably one and a half. So. We'll see some gains here. The headers have a pretty small outlet, but they're quite a nicely made thing. So we do have the choice of these or the original ones. So I want to put the exhaust on from the back section first and then see which one's going to fit better. One of the awesome things about being in a shop here is that there's lots of spares like bolts and stuff. But one of the not so awesome things about there being cats everywhere is in the bolt box, the cats think it's a litter box. So what I thought was a bolt was actually a shit. And so now my hand's covered in cat shit and bolts. So I'm going to wash all of them and install the exhaust. You do take for granted your tools and equipment when you're suddenly somewhere completely different. Everything takes that little bit longer. But what we lack for in tools, we've made up with an abundance of new aftermarket parts for this Kalisa. At home, this stuff is way harder to come across, so it should now all come together, assuming everything fits. We're replacing all the old worn out rubber bushings with polyurethane ones. They're a bit harsh on the road, but absolutely perfect for the racetrack. We're in the stock engine class, so what we lack in power, we're hoping to make up for in handling. I've got my hands on an alloy radiator. It's a bit thicker than stock and should increase our ability to cool the engine. And after seeing the sludge that came out of the engine, I'm sure the original radiator is nothing but a muddy bog hole. The factory fan gets bolted onto it and we are one step closer to turning the key. That is the oil cooler, very similar size to the one we did run at home. We actually had an oil cooler on the dyno, but then on our test car, it exploded, so we didn't have it for the track. Um, but we did use our sensors to keep track of the temperature. The Haltech will track the temperature of this the whole time, pressure and temp, so if anything funny happens, we're gonna know about it. But for now, I'm gonna try and find space in here with the rest of our cooling gear. Um, headers and cooler don't fit at the same time, so we're gonna have to choose. Uh, the other headers that we've got that are on this car look okay, so I think that's what we're gonna have to run with, but it means more mods to the exhaust. Bummer. All these parts are designed to be used on this car, but not necessarily designed to be used at the same time. So we're choosing reliability over performance. 
When oil gets really hot, it stops working properly, so this cooler will keep temperatures down while we're at full throttle around the racetrack. It comes with hoses that are way too long, but being we don't have the tools to shorten them, we'll just have to wrap them around the front of the car. Our bushes are in the trailing arms and our coilovers are ready to be installed. We've scored some bigger brakes from a Myvi, which is the next class of car up from ours, which bolts straight onto our hubs. But we'll need to get the discs machined and we'll need to get some new pads. We brought some braided brake lines with us from Australia in case the original ones were cracked or worn out. They fit, but the rear suspension is slightly different. With them in, we can add new brake fluid and bleed the whole system. It's now time to fill the car with all the required fluids and try and work out how to make it run. It strikes me just how quickly something like this can come together when you have a team of people all working towards a common goal. Alright, we are just hitting the street again. Uh, we put an order in for some oil, uh, but the oil hasn't arrived and we are almost ready to start the car, so we're off here uh, with Stacey, who's learned to drive manual specifically for, this, uh, for the race. How are you feeling about the race, Stacey? I'm nervous, I'm scared, <laughs> that's the truth, I mean, I'm excited because like we're doing all of this together and it's like, it's a dream I guess, like I've never, never in my life thought that this would ever happen to me. Excited and scared is a good combo. <laughs> Everything you do in your life should involve some element of excitement and fear, that's how you know you're doing the right thing. If it's just fear, might not be great. If it's just excitement, might not be great, a combination of both. That's when you know you're just on the edge of that comfort zone. That is the place to be. We googled shops that sell Castrol, but it looks like this place is made for two wheels, not four. I think this might be more a motorbike shop than a car shop, but we'll try our luck and see how we go. Hello. It turns out the oil we need is hard to find around these parts, but we've been given a tip for another shop where we can get some basic fluids and some running oil while we wait for our delivery back at Rab Garage. One of the unexpected consequences of a build like this in a foreign country is just not having access to the tools and supplies that we're so lucky to have back at home. And this means we have to adapt and make do with what we've got. We're sharing a single socket set, some basic spinners, and occasionally borrowing what appears to be the only power tool in the block from the guys on the other side of the building. We're flushing the fluid in the braking system and check out how much mud's in there. I don't think I've ever seen so much dirt in a brake system before. Dave is making great progress and thanks to some of our testing back home, we've worked out how to configure our dash to tell us when something falls outside of a set value. That could be hot coolant, low oil pressure, or a lack of fuel or even the mixtures being wrong. These early warnings prevent catastrophic failures that happen when you keep driving through big problems, especially for a race as long as the one we're going to. We have bitten off a giant chunk of automotive whatever this is, but we are attempting to build a race car that needs to compete in a 24 hour event but there's so many speed bumps and stuff we have to get over before then. Some of the tricks of kind of making a car like this not only building a race car out of suitcases uh, it's really really hot there's not much light here in the workshop and they achieve so much with really limited tools here like they don't have all the normal stuff that you would expect to see in a professional workshop but they still get so much done and we're having to do the same so this car is basically being built with a socket set some plies and a couple of screwdrivers and whatever scraps we can find around and the luckily place. there are scraps and there are spares around which has been a big big help but a lot of our parts that have arrived most of them fit but some of them don't like our seat for example we don't have the brackets we just don't have them they never rocked up so we have to somehow make the seat fit we have to get eight people comfortable in that car fire extinguisher hydration we haven't even turned the key yet and scrutineering is i don't know not that long tomorrow morning first tomorrow thing. morning We've managed to borrow a seat rail that's going to get us out of trouble, which means we can fit our racing seat. This also means we're going to be running a harness that's going to hold us in securely during the race, and this is a requirement for this particular endurance competition. We've reached that exciting but also scary part of the day where now we're going to turn the key for the first time and see if it actually cranks. Are we ready? Let's do it. All pressure is what we want. Ready? Yep. Once it fills the oil cooler, it'll need some more oil. Sounds good though. Yeah, sounds healthy. Same because it's got comp. We've come across a problem that we had not foreseen, and that is that the Perodua engine is actually a newer generation than our engine from home, meaning it uses different sensors, and they're sensors that we don't have. We're going to fit up the wheels and start working on the seat rail optimistically while Dave does some keyboard wizardry to try and make the Haltech interpret the signals that are coming from the Perodua engine sensors. Dave is ready to turn the key. It might backfire, it might make weird noises, the timing might be completely out because the triggering's different in Perodulas and Daihatsus. We learnt that today. Uh, cross your fingers, everybody. 
We good? It might start. It might. It also might explode. Cross your fingers Do the honours, Isaac. Go for it, mate. So it didn't start, as you could see. One more time, please. Good, some throttle. Yeah! Yes. 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 Good job, everybody. Damn, oh. sounds weird. Exhaust leak. Massive exhaust leak. So that's exhaust shot, that's where we're gonna go next. That's purring, mate, that's great. We now have to reassemble the car as quickly as we can so we can get it to the exhaust shop. Meanwhile, while we've been making our little race car, the Rab guys who work at this workshop have been pumping out customer cars all day in the heat. What they do and with limited tools is absolutely incredible. It's fascinating to see how cars are worked on in this part of Malaysia. So there are no hoists inside, so everything is done off jack stands. Something that Marty and I are very familiar with after years and years of kind of fixing cars on the driveway. But if you have a look over here, the cars literally just have a rock that is like holding them to stop them from falling down and then everything else is just done here on the street. You can see the ground, this is covered in oils and fluids and stuff from years and years of working on cars. And they literally have a little gazebo like this that they put up so they can stay out of that really, really oppressive heat. They've got very, very basic tools here. There's kind of only one DAC DAC. It seems to be getting shared around all of the different mechanics here. And this is how cars are fixed. So full of Daihatsu parts in there. They get the piece they need, they take it off, put it on, send it back out to the customers and go again. And as you can see, there's just little Daihatsus in various states of repair and disrepair absolutely everywhere. It seems strange, you know, if you're kind of compared to seeing these first world countries with all these amazing workshops, but this is how it's done in most of the world, including here in Malaysia. With a couple of rare exceptions, most of the cars in Malaysia are these little nuggets. The next thing I'm going to do is hit the streets by foot to try and find a hardware store. One of the things that they don't have at the workshop is a set of drill bits and that is required for the next part of our build. I've found this little supermarket, hopefully they'll have something. So one of the things that we don't have at the workshop is drill bits. I needed some uh, and they only had two or three drill bits, so I'm going to try and find that and then also, if I can, uh, get a drill and I'm going to donate that to the garage afterwards because they got basically one drill and one DAC and if I can give them a few more tools to keep them going, that'd be great. I'm kind of in... Look, it's not like a specialist car parts shop, but this is the hardware store. Like, this is it. So there's kind of homewares, very basic tools, uh, but hopefully there's some power tools here and hopefully there are some drill bits as well. This is actually one of the few hardware stores around here that you can actually look around yourself. Most of them are kind of like a takeaway shop where you have to just wait out the front and tell the person what it is that you need and they will go out the back into storage and then bring it out for you. You don't actually get a say in what it is or a choice or you don't get to browse. You just go, I want a drill and they'll bring it for you. So this one here is one of the rare occurrences where you can actually come in and have a look around, which is always interesting when you're in a new country. When you're in a cheap local variety store like this, it's very unlikely that there's going to be any quality tools or brands that we know, recognise and trust. But right now, this is a mission of necessity. And without a drill and drill bits, we're not going to be able to complete our build in time for the race. It's really interesting buying these tools from this shop. Everything is still done by hand. So each item, there's a little receipt pad. It's written down what you're buying, what its item number is, what it is, and then it's all added up with calculator and then you pay for it. It kind of... Seems a bit old fashioned, but the job is getting done. While I'm checking out with all of my drill bits, some of the staff have found a drill of questionable quality, which they've said I can have at a very special discounted price. Uh, so we've been given a little bit of a discount. I asked why um, and was told very honestly that the prices here are inflated so that then you can haggle and bring them back down to the normal price, which is still a bit inflated. Uh, I didn't know that's kind of how the system works, so he's just automatically applied the discount for me, which has just brought down the inflated price back to normal, uh, but appreciated nonetheless. Uh, terima kasih. Terima kasih. <laughs> they were so friendly, if only kind of more hardware stores were like that. Uh, he did just run out to tell me that uh, I get a one year warranty of the tools. Uh, I only need these to work for one day, but I'll hand them on them for the next 364 days. Hopefully they live on at Rab Garage. 
The reason we didn't bring our own power tools was due to weight, flying with lithium batteries, and we just had no idea that the tools available at this garage would be so limited and so basic. But our new drill is put to use immediately as we get the car ready for the road. Now it starts and it idles, but we need to get the suspension, wheels and panels sorted so that we can take it to the exhaust shop, which is just down the road. As we prepare to roll the car out of our little garage, it is truly time for a celebration that this little nugget actually works. Wow, dude. Wow. Feel lazy to you? Mmm, can't tell. No, no, actually not. Not really. Rut row, big road. No brakes, no tune, no nothing. That's exhaust. No, that's not exhaust. Yeah, it is exhaust. Oh, that is it. That's them. Sure. Yeah. Very good. Well done. Well done, you. We rolled up to the exhaust shop and found a treasure trove of aftermarket exhaust parts for all sorts of cars. It seems people here love noisy power adding exhausts just as much as we do. So we've ended up down at Zen Exhaust and the manager Alexis fit us in, which is awesome. I did buy an exhaust that was supposed to fit, but because of the mismatch with the oil cooler, it doesn't. Uh, luckily this was close by only a couple minutes down the road and luckily our car started because otherwise we would not have got here. Uh, the drive down here was pretty loud, but we made it. So now we're gonna put a new flange on the front pipe. He's also gonna put a flex in it because there is quite a bit of movement in those engine mounts. They're not solid mounts and the exhaust didn't come with a flex and the old one was cracked. So flex joint going in, new two inch, two bolt flange. So we've got a full two inch exhaust. Uh, and then we should be good to go. It turns out there's a family of cats that live in this exhaust shop too. They live in the scrap metal pile and will hide whenever the drop saw is used and then come back out again afterwards. Over the years of making this show, we've traveled to many places and worked on cars all around the world, but we have never seen people welding without goggles or a mask. But here in Malaysia, there are no goggles to be seen. All of the welding is done by eye. I've never seen anything like it in my life. The exhaust is on. It actually took a little while, but the guys took a lot of time to actually do a really good job of it. And it's properly sealed up, which is one more. We don't want leaks. We don't want any rubbish like that. It's moved a bit at the back, but I don't care because we've got to spend the time to do some other stuff. It is perfect for uh, racing. It's, it's near the end of the day now, uh, so uh, maybe we get some food and then it looks like it might be a bit of a late night because we've got scrutineering first thing in the morning uh, and we still don't have the seat, the harness, the window nets. Fire extinguisher, window nets. All the safety stuff. We've got a the car working now, we think. Uh, but now we've got to do all the safety gear and do it before 10 a.m. tomorrow. And if it's not right, we have tomorrow until the driver's briefing, briefing in the afternoon to fix it. Before we go, we'll have a quick listen to the exhaust. Listen to the meatiness of this perodua. Sounds quite vegan. Oh. Sounds like shit. <laughs> it does sound like shit, but it's not going to matter because it's going to be full revs down the racetrack. We're never going to hear the rasp. It's just going to be angry, like a swarm of bees. What do you think, guys? How does it sound? <laughs> it sounds broken. Healthy. <laughs> it works. Yeah. It's no, an be right. It's worry. an even. Nah, it's fine. Our exhaust is done and the boys here have done an excellent job. As we get closer to night time, we need to head back to Rad Garage to store the car for the night. But it looks like we're going to be driving right through a monsoon. I cannot see out the windscreen. It's 
pissing rain and a thunderstorm, we are hot. We have not tested the car. Dave's got his laptop out and like checking the trims. All that tuning work back home has paid off because the car is driving, but this is not how I expected to be tuning a car today. But we're doing it. This is hilarious. And this is a, you've got cold and cold up. There's no warm, you don't need it. Malaysia being so close to the equator has a wet and dry season, and this is the wet one. Meaning it's a tiny bit cooler, but it's humid and it rains nearly every day. We've got a little bit of time left to get our harness installed, set up our seat, and make sure all our mechanical parts are working properly. Each driver will get up to three hours in the seat, so it needs to be safe and comfortable for everyone. The brakes still feel a bit crappy, but there's also still mud coming out of them that we need to get rid of. With our fluid running clear, we can install our freshly machined discs. So what we're doing now is we're just setting up the harness so that it's suitable for all these different body types. So normally you would just kind of have a car that's built around one person, but because we're going to be swapping eight people in, we need the harness to work for the taller people and the shorter people. So we've just set it up uh, so that it's comfortable for me in my position, and then we can bring the seat all the way forward and now we're setting it up for Stacey as well and um, we've got enough kind of adjustability on the front here that we can lock in the, uh, the wraps in the back and that'll, that'll look great. We managed to score some good brake pads which will be a huge help on the track and the guys at the stereo shop next door offered us this mad tailgate spoiler and installed it for us. Total cost, 50 bucks. Absolute legends. And now that we've got some aero, we're only a toe strap, some wheel nuts and a few cable ties away from a working race car. So just a little over 24 hours ago, this car did not exist in this format mm -hmm. at all. Stock. Uh, but uh, yesterday and today, basically with hand tools and a whole bunch of help from both locals and our friends that we brought in, uh, we got a little race car now, which is amazing. We do, and there's a whole lot of extra things for endurance racing that I've never done before. We just started talking about it and thinking about it, like hydration. You're in here for not just for a session for 15 minutes, you could be in here for an hour or two, up to three hours per driver. And so having some water available to you, so we're going to mount this down here so you can quickly grab it if you have time. If not, you can carry it around with you. Yep. Small things like that. Lighting so we can see what we're doing. Um, better light upgrades for our headlights. Uh, but mechanically, yeah, it's it's good. Yeah. So tomorrow morning we've just got scrutineering. There's a couple of little things to do, like we'll put on some stickers and, and that kind of stuff, just little things. But for as far as the car is concerned, um, racing. it is done. So now we're all going to go get some pizza, yep. uh, get a good night's sleep, and then tomorrow uh, it's the last day before the race. So just our final preparations, anything at scrutineering that they're not happy with, we sort that out. Um, and then we've also got to sort out all of our own camera yeah. stuff and whatever so we can actually document this whole thing that's for right. you to see. Yep. Um, so that's kind of a whole other element. But that doesn't need to happen before the scrutineering. That's right. So. Scrutineering is the next big challenge. Hopefully there's nothing that we can't just fix, um, but we're feeling confident. All right. Well, let's go get some pizza or a curry, whatever Both. we can find. Pizza curry. Oh, curry pizza. <laughs> <laughs> In just 48 hours, we've managed to build a car that is now ready for the ultimate test of endurance. And it feels like the culmination of many years of friendship and many years working on these little cars. This would not have been possible without our amazing crew. And it's time to celebrate the only way we know how. Yes, we're gonna go and get a bunch of snacks before we hit the long road to Sepang Circuit. It's time to explore the, the cultural Sensation that is 7-Eleven. There's a cat that just got in, dude. With cats. Wow. Here we are. Let's go uh, straight to the, the bit Where that the matters. cats can roam free. It's just chilling in 7-Eleven, coming to get something to eat. So a lot of these stores, obviously, the food is the same everywhere, but there are going to be snacks that are specific, of course, to Malaysia. For example, this one, the dried green radish. Uh, that I've never seen. There's also a really good selection of chips, except for this one. Salted egg, nobody wants them. But Salted everything egg else, chip. everything else, I have to say, has been spectacular when it comes to the chips. Malaysia does chips very well, and Martin, I'm an enthusiast of would chips. Would you like a mixed bird's nest with collagen drink? Or a hot brew macadamia. What's that? What is that? Sparkling chupa chup. Look at that. Absolutely what is, what delicious. Is that melon milk? Is that for kids? I don't know what that is, Martin. Melon milk. There's lots of cow piss, that's everywhere. Dried carrot. More salted egg. Suitable for vegans. Of course it is. What else is in there? I'm gonna get some dried carrot. I'm gonna get some dried radish. Dude, chips to flaming barbecue. As if you don't want them. Apparently this is the mighty snack aisle. I'm rating the Malaysian 7-Eleven. I'm into it. Strawberry jam. 
Marble Fraggers. cake. Like right where you need them. Oh, stop it. Milo. Look what we've got, Martin. Uh, orange. A thousand oranges? A thousand lemons, but it's a thousand oranges. We're going to take those for good luck. The people here are so friendly. So friendly. Every single person I met is friendly, warm, smiley. Just smiling. High five. Waving. Yep. It's amazing. And a lot of them speak English really well, so yep. it's like you feel you know, comfortable getting around. You it's feel welcome. It's a beautiful country. Cool cars. It's hot. It's hot, but once you get past that, beautiful. And it is an amazing selection of cars. Like, there's an Evo over there. Oh, yeah. There's little nuggets over here. There's yeah. protons everywhere. Um, Heaps anyway, of modified stuff. Martin, I'm going to wish us a safe and pleasant track experience. A thousand a oranges. Days. A thousand oranges. A thousand oranges. oranges, which I guess is Malaysia's version of a thousand oranges. Seems appropriate. Still but an Asian country. we salute the lords of safety and excitement. Prepare yourself. Prepare your belly. Three, two, one. The burp of good luck. Oh, mate. Right, let's go to the racetrack. All right, let's do it. We've thrown on our original Love Heart wheels so we don't scrub out our track tyres on the highway to Sepang. This circuit was built in just two years back in the late 90s. It hosted the Formula One for 18 years and is hugely popular. It's covered in Petronas logos, which is the government-owned oil giant which now has the naming rights. And you see the logos all over the country, everywhere you go. I've arrived at the Pang Circuit, F1 Circuit, in a Parodua that didn't exist 48 hours ago in its current form. So we've got to go to scrutineering. I have no idea where anything is, so let's try and work that out, shall we? As we drive in, we see the scale of both the track itself and the event. Plus, we start to see some of the other teams that are racing. With purpose-built shipping containers, with purpose-built race cars, covered in bumps and bruises from races past, and teams of drivers and mechanics meticulously setting up in the pit garages that they've been allocated. There are Daihatsu Copens, Honda Beats, and a wide range of Perodua cars like the Kalises and Canaris. And yes, we're starting to get properly nervous. This is really happening, and we've got the hopes and dreams of a whole nation on our shoulders. This is our pit garage, pit garage number 20. And uh, we do our scrutineering, we do our signing in, and then we race tomorrow. And circuit, not just like a little circuit, it's the circuit in Malaysia. Formula One circuit. It's incredible, the pit is huge. We do have some work to do on our car, the clutch needs adjustment, the brakes need bleeding. We're not done yet, and we've got scrutineering in probably 10 minutes. So we have some work to do, uh, but very excited. We get our little car back up on stands and give it a final check over, put our race wheels on and set up our pit garage. To qualify to participate in the event, you have to come up with an original team name. And after about an eight second brainstorm, there's only one that seemed appropriate. We are team Koala Lumpur Racing. Looking around the pits, you can see some of the mods that other teams have added to their colorful race cars to make them suit this environment. Brake biasing, big cooling ducts for the brakes and the drivers, lightweight components and epic wraps and colour schemes. There's a bunch of stickers we need to apply like our race numbers and there's some final tweaks we need to make so the car can be scrutineered. In an unexpected turn of events, our car has failed scrutineering. So there's a bunch of regulations that we had to tick off with the car that was on this giant list and we've ticked them all off, certain suspension, certain roll cage, certain seat mounting, certain everything. But no kill switch, but which was not on the list. Switch, which, look, a lot of cars do need them, but it wasn't on the list. But they're like, oh, you need one. So now we have to try and get a kill switch and install it. Um, and I guess it has to be accessible from the outside, although there's no details so about how that works. When are they coming back, though? Because they could have scrutinied everything else. They should, because we might be kill switching tonight. Yeah. By the time we get one, get back here, get the tools to install it. Luckily, Dave will be able to help us, hopefully. But uh, yeah, that's a pain in the bum. So we just found out that we need a kill switch. I'm going to go and uh, ask uh, one of the other teams that we met earlier. They were all Mighty Car Mods fans from Malaysia. And they said if we need anything to come and ask, so I'm going to go and find out uh, what we need to do. Hello again. Yes. We do not have a kill switch. Do you know where we buy one? Oh. Like, can we... What are you looking for? Kill switch. Kill switch. Because it's, it's not in the regulations. Yeah. And we said to them, it's not in the regulation, and they went, yeah, we know, but you need one anyway, so... It's in Malaysia. Yes. Between the lines. Yeah, okay, right. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, I think... You can get it from Thailand. Yeah. 
So the way that they've done this, this is a boot release, and this here just has a cable. If you come around and have a look over here, when you pull this, it's pulling this cable here, which is flicking the toggle inside, which is us, you know, turning it on and off. So really utilitarian, but it works. Basic, but if it works, it works. Thank you very much, everyone. Cheers. Have you ever had your car defected or done mods and you're going over the pits to see if you can drive it again? I can imagine it kind of feels like that. The scrutiny is then returned to check off everything else that was on their list, but we still need to get a kill switch. Is our car scrutinied successfully yes, though? Yes, except, yeah, except for kill switch. Except for that. Okay, yeah. our car is done. We got to add a kill switch. Other than that, we're sorted. So, uh, good job. Run. Have you found a local place? Yeah, just nearby here. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. I wouldn't mind coming actually to see it. We jumped into the car and set off to the nearby town. We're quite away from the big city, but if we're lucky, we might be able to get what we need. After visiting four shops, we finally found one that had kill switches in stock. Yes. Perfect. A battery cable yeah. and some lugs. That's great. Thank you. Julian, unless they have the whole kit. You're okay, is it? Yeah, I think this is okay. Yeah. Uh, one meter. Along with your usual array of stereo equipment and pod filters and exhausts, one mod featured heavily in a lot of these shops which were dotted through the town next to the circuit. Aftermarket air conditioning. And after spending a few days here, I can totally understand why. So we've managed to find an auto parts store to get our switch here. Uh, and we've just gone to a motorbike shop and got this cable. Uh, so the last thing that we need is the lug. Yep that goes on there uh, and then basically we'll connect this, bypass the power to the battery, drill a little hole, make this accessible on the outside of the car with a little sticker pointing at it saying that this is a kill switch and then they can pull it if they need to. Very unlikely we'll need it but it's part of the regulations that are not part of the regulations. <laughs> we tried a heap of different stores but kept coming up blank on terminals. Don't you think this looks like a Mitsubishi Sigma mixed with like a yeah, Pintara mixed actually, with a... Yeah, but actually, I think this is a... A Sota? It's a Saga. Martin, this is quite strange. That's a welding helmet, and uh, we didn't see those yesterday when the exhaust was being made. The first time ever that a grounding kit is actually useful is when you can't get terminals. A HKS, well, it says HKS, and if it's legit, a grounding kit might actually get us out of trouble because we have one hour until the driver's briefing. After a whole lot of no's, we finally got lucky. We might be in lucky. It's an alternator shop where they rebuild alternators. Yes, mother load, we found them. With everything we needed, we're going to grab some quick food for the crew and then head back to the racetrack. I mean, this is something that you wouldn't see a lot in Australia, like just chicken feet and stuff just out in the open like this. I don't know what's... I actually don't know what that is. Do you know what that is, Martin? Uh, uh... I... I uh, no. no. Some octopus. Kerrang fish. And... Oh, there's the meal guts. What's that one? Sotong you? that's, uh... Octopus. Look at this. Now, when you go to a supermarket in Australia, you might see a small section that's got bird's eye chilies. Look at this. That informs the flavour of this culture. Australian you know? cow milk. You can get for approximately two or three dollars Australian. Like it's worth it to milk wow. the cow in Australia, send it to Malaysia, and then sell it for two or three bucks. That's Crazy. amazing. Um, I am feeling like something maybe fried, though. Not flied, but fried. I don't fried. really feel like seafood at the moment or ever again. We're going to head back to Sepang and continue the prep on our car. While Dave and Isaac get our kill switch working, we're going to prepare our fuel by draining all the low octane fuel out of the tank. Then we can finalise our stickers we brought with us for the race and head to the driver's briefing. We're going to be running an iPad mini as a lap counter and we're mounting it to our roll cage using a quad lock mounting system. These come in various designs for cars, motorbikes, cycling, and will securely hold it in place with its dual stage locking system. With everything installed and working, it's time to head to the compulsory driver's briefing. Turns out it's the very first time they've had an Australian team and they were very welcoming. 16. From Australia, come all the way. What? Ah. What? Oh, 16. Oh, 16, exactly, car number 16. Be 16, okay. Our race number is 16, and by coincidence, so is our start position. With the driver's briefing sorted and the cars through scrutineering, we packed up and headed home for an early night because tomorrow will be the actual race. Race day. 
We've all worked so hard for this moment, and now we just have to hope that our little car is up to the task. We are as prepared as we can be for a bunch of Aussies who flew in just a couple of days ago with zero endurance experience. We have no idea what's going to be in store for us during this event. starts in just a few hours time and we're all feeling nervous but all we need to do now is to get our car to the fueling bay to get our first fuel allocation then we can push it onto the starting grid. This will be our little Perodua's first time on a racetrack ever. It's already done nearly a quarter of a million kilometres of driving in its first life before graduating to being an endurance race car. With our car in position on the starting grid, it's time for the pre-race festivities to begin. The organisers played both the Malaysian and Japanese national anthems, which meant we had to do our own. This is it people, this is the moment that we've been waiting for. We're about to start the 24 hour race. That's right, I'm all suited up, I'm driving number one. We're going to do about half an hour and then we're going to swap so everyone gets to go. And then just keep racing for 24 hours. It's hot, it's sweaty, it's stinky, but it's a lot of fun. But right now it's a Le Mans style start. So basically the mascot uh, will start at a certain line, run to the car, rip a sticker off. And then we when they up. rip it off that's the start of the battle. Alright, let's do it. Marty's getting suited up ready to kick off the racing and then we'll drive a swap as we need to. We don't have a rigid plan because we just don't know how it's going to go, but most crashes happen at the start of races, so I've got some final words of advice. Alright, so obviously keep yourself alive, number one, keep the car alive, keep it calm for now. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon, 24 hours, so just, just so, take it easy for a bit. So chop everyone. Yeah. At least try. At least try and chop everyone. <laughs> In truth, we just want to actually finish the race, but with everyone's eyes on the clock, at 10 seconds before midday, the countdown starts, and it's all come down to this. Stacy dressed in an inflatable koala suit, sprinting across the track so that we can start the race. That is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. If you don't do this activity, you will be disqualified. It didn't make any sense until today, but this is just epic. The starting ceremony is done. Now we do a formation lap, and then it's race time. The formation lap is pretty fast. I think it's gonna be absolutely wild when we get started. It's gonna be great. All my pressures look good, temperatures look good. Ready to send it. Okay, we're coming up to the last corner. That's the parade lap, that's the formation lap basically done. I think from here the safety car will pull off and we'll just send it. It's gonna be chaos. All right, we're on. Green light. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so Marty's just uh, passed over the start line. So this is lap number one, minute number one, 24 hours to go. I thought I'd just get blown past, but what a similar power. The cars are actually dividing up pretty evenly, so people in the higher classes are blasting past, but it's taking the other guys a lot longer to get past. Three wide, the 
crazy. <laughs> Just planning on doing half an hour each to keep the car going, make sure it's okay. Uh, and we still got a, we got a lot of time here, a lot of time ahead of us. Got to do 60 k's in the pit lane. They're out there with the signs, so I can see where to stop, which is excellent. Yeah. yeah. After a hugely successful first session and the car still working, it's time for the first driver change and I'm jumping in behind the wheel. Good luck man, have fun. Enjoy Thank yourself. You. All right, so my first few laps, what can I tell you? Um, the car held together brilliantly, it handles Awesome. The suspension is great. The setup that Julian did with the string line is great. The tyres are really good. Everything's fine with handling. It feels slow, but it's also a pro job. And there's guys in similar classes. I can see their stickers. And the stickers are the same colour. They're kind of advantages in some areas and not. So in our class, I think we're somewhere in the middle. Uh, but we'll get better at it as we go. And also, I don't want to kill the car in the first lap. So I was looking after it. But all, I was watching the temperatures really closely. Oil temp good. Oil pressure good. Coolant. Everything just very happy position. So. That was a good first lap. Now we can do that for another 23 and a half hours. Alright, here we go. is making some weird sounds but we can't work out what it is so we're sending out Ying to do a few laps. 
Call me in if you need anything. Just find your place, alright? You all right. do your thing, you do what you can do. Dominate. Yeah. Thank Thank you. Thank you. You got this, dude. Alright, can you just listen out? Call me in if it sounds like us. The coolant temperature shooting up so suddenly is a bit unusual, but it's also settled again really quickly and stayed controlled with the fan. So we did a quick check of our clams and coolant level and sent Isaac out to do some test laps to see if he could replicate the issue. We've got a live video feed going back to the pits which I made out of a transmitter that's usually used for drones. Problem is, it only works for half the track because the antennas got stuck in customs. Just looking back through the data logs, we can actually see that the coolant temp slowly, slowly crept, 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 and then it got to a point where it released on the cap, and she actually saw it. So it's been good to sort of see maybe why, um, maybe she was stuck behind a car for a while and it got a lot of dirty air and it didn't actually cool the car. Um, maybe she's just really, really into it and just going as hard as she can. We'll just have to see how the car feels after this lap with Isaac on it. We've got some ignition timing issues in fourth gear. Corn temp's high, corn temp's high. Pinging its head off in fourth gear. Fourth gear, pinging its head off. Yep, 100%. We're top a third, and as soon as you grab fourth gear, any load, it's just pinging and getting hot. So we need to pull timing out of it or work out what the issue is. It's starting to appear that not all is well with our Perodua. We've been out for just under two hours, but it's making noises that you can hear from the outside as the car comes down the straight, and the coolant temperature is all over the place. All we can do is check the cooling system and do more investigation, which requires driving the car. And the only place we can drive it is back on the racetrack. Right, Isaac is going to go out, even though we're due for a driver swap, he's going to go out again. He had the problem, he'll be able to help diagnose it if we do have an issue. We think maybe it's a wiring problem, he's making a run, like just ping and carry on and not be happy, which does make stuff overheat. Whether we've killed that engine and done a head gasket is the question that we'll answer now. It's not long before Isaac radios in with the news. No, it's okay, but more timing out of the top of fourth gear still. Endurance racing is all about completing laps and maximum distance. So as long as the car is still able to move, then the best place for it to be is out on the track. And Stacy is the next driver behind the wheel. Pretty soon into her session, we can see the red lights flashing on the dash, and that means our coolant temperature is too high. So she'll have to bring it in and we'll have to work out what's going to fix it once and for all. I'm getting used to it now, but it's just that I'm just trying to let everyone pass me if I, if I have to pass. I'm just going as 
the pace that I can. We've been coming to Sepang for the longest time, but never in a million years I think that I would drive here. Uh, so the car was running really hot, pinging, lots of detonation. Uh, tried to throw some more fuel at it, didn't fix the problem. Um, just had a look at the spark plugs, it looks like one of the cylinders might be dead, so currently uh, it's looking like it might be head gasket. Uh, we did bring a spare one. It's just a matter of if we change that, whether we're putting a warped head back on, if it's already been damaged by heat, we just don't know, so currently working that out of the line. The head gasket is sandwiched between the block and the head, and when they let go, it's not an easy fix. Combustion pressure can make its way into your cooling system, which pressurises it and causes overheating. Or, oil can get into your cooling system, which is also a bad thing. The same dirty brown coolant that was all through the engine when we pulled it out last time is visible on the spark plug, which tells us coolant is leaking into the cylinders. That's bad and there is no easy fix for this, so it means our engine will need to be split in two. Turns out we aren't the only team having some issues. Our next door neighbours in the pits have blown an engine and are scrambling to replace it with their spare, which gave me the idea of going and getting a spare for us. If I can be doing that so that if in two hours time you try and get this working and it doesn't work, we just go, here's an engine that I've already got, rather than then we start another three hour cycle. I like that. I think when the head's off, I'm going to have a really good answer for you. Let's get heads off then, let's make a decision. When we take the head off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, let's yeah. get the head off, yeah. have a look, make a decision and then I'll... Yeah. Oh, come on. That makes it work. Yeah, right. yeah okay. Alright. I've always associated blown head gaskets as a side effect of chasing big power, but we don't have a turbo or performance mods to push the limits of the engine. The car did work okay when we got it, so it wasn't on my radar of things that could go wrong. We've only brought the most basic set of tools that we needed for a job like this, so Ying and I are visiting a bunch of the other team garages to try and find a socket that will allow us to remove the head bolts, because without it, we are properly stuck. A short time later we managed to get the head off and this will tell us once and for all what's causing the overheating and the weird sounds on the racetrack. Okay, cool. Straight up. Just lift the head. Don't, straight straight up. Up. don't tip the head. We just need to see the combustion chambers. Yeah, you so, can see where it leaked through. So it leaked through. So you blew it out in the centre cylinder. In the centre. But what we're looking for but is that, any, any parts of a valve missing, like a hot valve. But see how that's real brown and nothing else is? That's because it yeah. copped all the water, eh? That copped all the water. If we continue to run it, it was the temperature of it. What I was looking for to see the seats damaged or yeah. there's a crack between, say, the spark plug boss and an exhaust there. valve. But it, it seems Dude, obvious. I don't think it's like catastrophically wrecked. Me neither. Me neither. These two cylinders were healthy as. Yeah. This guy may have been gone even before we started racing. So we can face that gasket, face that. Face that let's face just that. do that, man. Yeah. And you know what we can do? And it probably seems really dodgy for people watching, but we can actually slaz up that gasket and we can send it with slaz. We can fill the void and put it down. It's, you can rub it in, just yeah. a thin coating. We'll rub it in anyway. It. Yeah. yeah. So and how do we clean that when it's... We, all we've got is a scraper, a paint scraper. Okay, paint scraper is what it is and yeah. let's do so it. So brake clean and, and a paint scraper, all right. this should be sweet. Cool. This is where we're at. Uh, it looks like we might be able to slaz up a head gasket and put this back together and maybe make it work. Uh, to get an engine is going to be a three to four hour round trip at least. So that would be going to Kuala Lumpur. Assuming I can find someone that can sell us an engine or get one from Rab, then get back here. So currently we're actually just going to roll the dice and send it. Uh, we'll know in the next, yep. take probably an hour and a half to put everything back together again. Yep. Uh, and um, we just want to try and get going again so that like Ebony and James uh, and Stacey can get some runs on the board. Uh, if that doesn't work, then we'll go back to Kuala Lumpur by an engine tonight, come back fresh in the morning, swap the engine out uh, and then you know, do the last few hours. Uh, we, we don't, we're not going to quit yet, uh, but it's also looking a little dire, but we're going to send it with what we've got. We did bring a head gasket. 
An extensively equipped machine shop would normally be involved in this process, but not us and not today, as we have a race to finish and with a healthy amount of finger crossing and of course Isaac's handwritten notes on EJDE engines, we're going to put this thing back together and get it out onto the track as quickly as we can with whatever tools we can find. That's right, a beat up gasket from my suitcase and a $1.80 tube of silicon is going to be holding this thing together for the rest of the race. decided to remove our oil cooler, we saw another team do the same thing, they had an engine failure, they got rid of their oil cooler system because the mechanic was like, don't need it. It's colder than we expected, we're going into the night time, and honestly, our oil temps are actually too low. So we're going to block that, or just remove it. So, we can always put it back, it'll take 10 minutes to put it back on, but for now, keep it very simple, try and take more problems away. This race is not stopping for anyone. The rain is pouring down and cars are spinning off the track and suffering mechanical failures just like us. But in every pit garage, there's a determination to get back out there, to keep going. And every now and then you'll hear the cheering of a team who's just overcome a massive obstacle and managed to get their little car back onto the track. Taking the head off means we have to set up the timing belt so that the crank and camshafts are in the correct positions at the correct time. Getting this wrong means bent valves and that would be catastrophic engine failure. It's all hands on deck and it looks like we might just be in with a chance. We're going really well. We've put our head gasket in, we slazed it up, don't try that at home. We still got a lot to do because we've got to make sure it runs and idles and starts and we don't have the same problem, we don't create more problems. And just check our work because we're rushing but we're not on a stupid mistake to wreck it. So still sweating, still hot. Um, the race has been going for, what, four, five, five hours? We're still in it. So one of the gentlemen from the Japanese teams saw that we had no radio this round. He's like, give me a minute. Now he's making us one. How cool is that? That's awesome. We didn't ask these guys to help. They were just interested in what we were doing and decided to offer their expertise. The ducting means more air will go through our radiator rather than around it and should help keep our temperatures down. Julian brought a few ducts with him that we were originally going to put on our brakes. Now that our oil cooler has been deleted, there's more room at the front of the car which I'm going to use to make a cold air intake. I'm going to drill out the air box, use some tin snips that we finally uncovered at a hardware store and run the ducts from the front bumper bar. Cold air combusts better than hot air which means more power and cooler running which is exactly what we need. This bunch of absolute legends here have managed to change the head gasket in a little under three hours. Uh, a bunch of different changes have been made, so we've removed the air conditioning, so there's no kind of, um, nothing in front of the radiator now, so it should be getting fresh air. We've added a cold air intake. Uh, we've also got rid of the oil cooler because it just doesn't seem like it's necessary. Cold oil, not great. Um, so the bumper's going back on now. We're gonna turn the key. And if nothing else, we want to get the last three drivers out there, which is going to be James, Stacey and Ebony. So we want to make sure they get a run and hopefully, fingers crossed, it, uh, it keeps working all night. We just need the head gasket to seal and the coolant and oil to stay where they're supposed to. That was two or three of the most hectic hours of my entire life. I'm going to uh, test it. I'm going to get suited up while they bleed the coolant and check the oil do a lap and cross our fingers. Normally you'd spend an entire day on a job like this and then test drive the car multiple times. Our test drive is a racetrack. Yeah, all right. We're gonna try start it up. Yeah! 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 How good. Julian, come here. Nah. Good job. You're a machine. Run it. Let's go. Yes. Right 
Nothing goes nothing. I feel pokier. Come on, little car. Give us a couple more laps. That's all we want. Everything seems okay so far. Okay, good on. We are getting pretty low on fuel though, so we will probably have to get fuel. Temperatures, pressures look good, so I think we're okay to do some laps. The race has now been going for just over six hours. It's rained, cars have crashed, some have broken down, including ours, but we are determined to get our drivers in. We want to keep getting the laps in and hopefully get the car through the night all the way through to midday tomorrow. It's now about consistency, preserving the car, not running it into anything and putting in some good laps. particularly what we're looking out for? Uh, just the coolant yeah, exactly. temp. Yeah. Yep. Basically if we're hitting 98, 99, 100, it'll then bring up a banner like that. Yeah. And it will flash red. Here we go. Thank you. Ebony can drive like an absolute boss and it's time for her to hit Sepang for the first time. doing another driver change and Julian is about to jump in behind the wheel. is running great. The lap total is piling up and we're feeling good. All of our drivers are getting plenty of time in the seat and we even had time to check out a Malaysian fan's Porodua at the back of our pit garage with all the same mods as our original Blue Turd except with a turbo and every MCM sticker in the catalogue. What a legend. Every time we do a driver change we're bringing the car into the pit garage because you're not allowed to work on your car in the pit lane. While one of us helps with the harness, the rest of the crew are using that time to check for leaks, rattles or anything else that might ruin our race. Next up, it's James's turn for some laps. He's daily driven Sears since he got his license and he's done more track laps in this kind of car than the rest of us combined, so I reckon he's probably going to smash out some pretty fast lap times. Oh, it feels so much grip. It feels amazing. It feels so much faster. Cool is perfect. The car feels really, really, really good. It's great to get the team managed to get this sorted. I mean, pumping it and it's stable at 80 degrees, it's not moving at all. Starting to get through a bit of traffic, but it's not too bad. 
Okay, flying left, let's go. Proper hard flying left. guests came along, which is Stacy's family who live a couple of hours from the track. They'd never been to a racetrack before, let alone watch their daughter race against 40 other very competitive race cars. As we keep cycling through all the drivers to make sure that everybody gets a crack, my turn has come around again, so I'm strapped in and ready to hit the racetrack. All right, it's dark now, so I think it's going to be a very, very different experience. Here we go. The car's feeling great. It's feeling so good. We need fuel, it's on 15%, it just flashed when I got into pits. Oh, okay, anybody will need to fill up again. Good to go? Yeah, I think you're good to go. See you on Thank you. Everything seemed to be going well, but then something weird started happening with the gear stick. Running, all good. Well done. 
I'm just adjusting the leverage on the pedal. Um, I had a couple of goes at this today and it lets me cheat a little bit more adjustment at the cable for whatever reason. I mean, it kind of appears that I'm just adjusting the position of the pedal, but it's also moving around over the course of the day. So, you know, heat, this thing's constantly hot, so everything's just getting bigger. So we're just essentially just trying to tighten it back up for the next driver. We're having trouble finding second gear and reverse, that sort of thing. So hopefully this just gives us that, um, that little bit more we need. Everything good? Yeah, yeah. Ready to go. Oh, second gear Isaac is giving the clutch cable an adjustment to see if we can free it up so that the gears can be selected more easily. Then Ying's going to go back out to complete her session. The car's put in some excellent laps since we fixed the head gasket. As long as we can keep the gearbox alive, we may still be in with a chance to finish this event. it's becoming evident that unfortunately our little car probably isn't going to survive another 15 hours in its current condition. We need to make a plan. I know somebody said a couple of years ago the Japanese team won. They took two and a half hours off and they still won because of everyone else's problems. So what we're talking about potentially doing is if, if the maths is correct, we're going to run out of fuel three hours before the end, if the rough maths is correct. Yeah. We've got fuel, but it's not just about fuel, it's about no. whether about the car. mechanically. Because yeah. Yeah. everyone wants to finish the race, that's the goal yes. for most people. Or you're trying to fully win it. Because of our break, we can't win it. Yeah. That's okay, we didn't come in to try and beat everyone. We tried to come in and try and finish it. So it's whether you take a couple of hours off, mm -hmm. give the car a proper once over, everyone has a chill out, gets the energy back, and then we hit it hard, like super early in the morning, yeah. is an option. Because if we stop at 2.30 in the morning because there's a problem, that's just the end. You know, maybe some of us are sleeping, some of us are sitting around. It would be better for us to stop with everybody all out there on the line cheering at midday. Yeah. yeah. So that's we what we want to have a meeting about anyway and just see what you all think, really. 
Yeah. I'm also happy just to burn the midnight oil and keep going all night. It's just about whether we make it or not. It's going to make tomorrow worse. And if we have enough tyres, enough spares, and if we had three gearboxes and two engines here, I'd be like, well, we, we got all the shit in the world. We, we don't. Yeah. Yeah. And the later it gets, the harder it is to get that those parts. If what are you reckon? Be cool. Be cool. But I'd like to see everyone across the finish line tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Yeah. I've never done an endurance race, so I don't know. The car seems to want to do under it. Absolutely fine. Yeah. yeah. Engine wise, it looks really, really good. Just the noise. Also, that engine's been broken since the day we started. Yeah. 100%. You just yeah. had a conversation. Yeah. You already yeah. had it in yeah. retrospect. Yeah. I was, I I did you explain it. David, it clicked. Yeah. The, we started it. I looked at the dash and went. I looked at Isaac and went, this is 40 pounds of coolant to push up. And Isaac went, uh, no, it can't. Up, and I went, yeah. Okay. yeah. I just missed it six, instantly. Six, six, three, six, four, six. Yeah. So, so basically, yeah, day That's one, car was broke, yeah, okay. and now it's at normal numbers because we've fixed the car, so we should preserve it. Yeah, it's going to break. Yeah. I reckon maybe 11 or 12. Depends yeah, how it is. Since push water would be good, I didn't change the oil anyway, because it's probably a bit of water in the oil. We might try to make the transmission for it as well. Yeah, we can do something. Once it's cold. Once, once it's sat for an hour, two or three, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Check every fluid, yeah. all change if we want. Give it a birthday before And then go. Yeah. And if it's still going and it's loving it and there's no problems, I don't mind if we put the heat back in, because yeah. we'll know. Yeah. Looks like we might have lost second gear. Um, Ying just drove around it. So I'm going to try and do the same, but we're going to try and just take some heat out of the car now and see what kind of lap times we get, see if we can preserve it. This is a hard choice that we weren't expecting to have to make. Do you keep putting laps in with a hurt car to bring your total up and improve your standings, but potentially kill the car trying? Or do you park it up, let it cool down, get spare parts, and then hit it again harder knowing you're more likely to have the reliability to make it right through to the finish, but then potentially also come last? Is coming last better than not finishing at all? I think so, but stopping driving is still a tough choice. To be completely certain of what we're dealing with, we're going to try everything we can before we park the car up and miss out on valuable lap times. And in the meantime, we also need to investigate getting more spares, in case it really does go wrong. And we do have some spares, but they're sitting on a shelf 10,000 kilometres away back home. I'm getting late, I'm getting tired, the gearbox doesn't work and I'm losing my voice. Good times. Okay, mate. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the, the faster you're going, the worse it is. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying to them. I'm like, in the pit's fine. I can get rolling out. Yeah. That's why we just give time. it everything. I'll do one more and then that's what we get. That's what we get. Yeah. You can drive it, it's just hard. Yeah, 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 I'm, I noticed that too. Thank you. Okay, Your average car has about 30,000 parts if you break it down to every last nut and bolt. We've relied on a significant serving of hopes and dreams for them to all hold together this far, and we're nearly halfway through the race. We aren't out yet, but what we do next will have the biggest effect on whether we can cross the line in 13 hours time, or sit in the pits with a broken hatchback while everyone else celebrates. It's becoming harder and harder to change gears. Each time we do, it crunches the synchro, and depending on the rev, sometimes it won't go into gear at all. At this rate, we will end up destroying the box, and there's no way we're going to make it through the night, let alone finish the race. Isaac's going to jump in one last time to see if there's any other adjustments that may help improve it at all, and in the meantime, Marty and Dave are going to try and find a spare gearbox. Okay, so it is nearly midnight. Me and Davo are going to head back to Rab Garage. They kindly left us the key. We're going to go to Rab, throw the spare gearbox into the van, drive it back to the track. 
Then I think we're going to shut down for a bit, let the car cool down. Then we're going to put the new gearbox in because currently you can drive it, but the this, this synchros are like toast. So we need another gearbox. There's now two teams driving through the night, one chasing parts on the highway and one chasing laps on the racetrack. Everyone is tired, but there's no way we're giving up. There's a safety car out. Would you like me to come in? I'm happy to stay out at the moment. Yeah, probably stay out, mate. The track is so long, it's often hard to tell what's triggered a safety car. But so far we've seen a few cars come too hot into corners and fly off the side of the track, or suffer a mechanical fault that leaves them stuck out there. But like us, all the teams are determined to finish the race, so they work through the night to get back out on track. I think I'll come in on this lap. Yeah, yeah, just I didn't want to get caught out in the fight after the safety, the safety car. I didn't want to get caught out in the fight straight after. Oh, yeah. They'll yeah. all get me. Oh, and yeah, because they'll. I just thought I don't want to push it. I was driving it fine, double clutching second gear yep. all the time, a hero in tow. I was getting it. Oh, double clutching. And I had, okay. some, and I had some pace. Yeah. Um, but as soon as the safety car came out, yeah, it's not everyone, it. it was just rah, rah, and you yeah, can't yeah. pass anyone safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the middle of the night, and the car has been at it for well over 12 hours now. We're all starting to feel the fatigue set in, but we also now have a replacement gearbox. If we can get it working, that will keep us in the race. This is my hustle, power and muscle. No fear in my eyes, from ashes we rise. Opposition don't face me, look how they made me. They look at me crazy, but I'm built for this crazy. Countdown and we blast off Let them see me with the mask off Tell them I'm here when they ask y'all You know it's all gas when I pass y'all Applying that pressure, we gon' raise the stakes The only way to separate the real from the fake We always show up, boy, nobody's safe Beating on my chest, I was raised by the apes Catching every breath with each step One more move in, this could go left Gathering every ounce of my strength Keep on moving, let's go to full length Don't ever doubt me, it's unlikely That I go out without fear Fighting, it's all in writing, I'm destined to be And I will never let any of y'all take it from me So close I can feel it in the air So tired but we almost there Hold on longer, grip on tighter Buckle down, we gon' take this higher Battle scars from battles won Battle tested but we ain't done Deep breaths, I can see it from a distance Little moment, victory through resistance This is my hustle Power and muscle Opposition don't face me. Look how they made me. They look at me crazy. But I'm built for this crazy. Yeah, third world struggle breeds character. Program to break barriers. Focus and block out the noise. All of these hurdles are fuel for the ploys. They don't care about what you did. They only care about what you're doing. So we don't ever, ever get complacent. But we don't worry about who we facing. Get out the way. We get ran over. We fight through the pain. Till it's all over. After a few hours on the highway, Dave and I have returned with our spare. We're going to find any spot we can to grab some rest while the car cools down so we can replace the gearbox and try and get back in the race. Circle the winners, which side will you choose? Underestimate me, that will never break me That will only take me where I need to be It's a hard climb, and I've been waiting No more complaining, no time remaining Keep pushing hard, victory lap Only go forward, there's no looking back It's a killer instinct, it's time to attack You best strap up and brace for impact back. This is my hustle It's the early hours of the morning when something amazing happens The sound of tools spinning up on the car have got the attention of some of the other race teams our neighbours notice that our car is off the track and the front end is off and without hesitation they're all hands on. So currently there's a whole lot of people working on the car, going to pull the engine, change the box, get it back in and hopefully uh, keep us going for a few more hours. The sun is still not up but all of a sudden there are people everywhere, mechanics, team managers, people who have spent their lives working on these cars and spend their weekends racing. It's like a well-oiled machine as they start their race spec engine teardown. It's actually nearly impossible to get in there to do anything. They're so keen. 
It's almost like their shit didn't break. So they, know they want to fix something. We're the right team for the broken shit. These guys are working in fast forward, and at this rate, we'll have the entire drive line out, fixed, and back in again in minutes, rather than the hours it took earlier in the week. Looks like our clutch might have been actually way too heavy, and that has not helped the gearbox, which was probably tired already, so we've gone back to a combo of our two clutches, which should be a bit more gentle on the box, but we're still gonna be careful with it. With our two teams working together, bonded over this unlikely little nugget, we quickly get all the fluids, shafts, cooling system and wiring back in while the race continues. Swapping a gearbox might not be a big deal for these guys, but the generosity they've shown is something I'll never forget. When we were all running on fumes, they showed up and helped us get the job done and get our car back on track. And as the sun rises over Sepang Circuit, Marty jumps back into his race suit. We've got one final team check-in and then we are back, back on the track and back in the game. Feels good. Headlights are on. Probably notice we're not talking on that much because you need so much focus on this track with so many people door to door. Oh, I got second gear. Yeah, we're in the game. All the gears work. Repeat, all the gears work. Back in the game. With a test lap completed that I'm going to call a victory lap, it's time to get the rest of the drivers in, make any final adjustments and get some laps under our belt. Uh, the gearbox feels amazing, the clutch is a bit slippy but also our adjustments are all out now and that clutch was covered in crap. It was a hard compromise between the clutch we put in that wreck for the last gearbox or this clutch which is probably too soft, but we just got to drive around a bit, just have some fun now. We've had to reset all our clutch adjustments back to their original positions, and now I can go out for a few hot laps of my own. We are keeping up, yes! I want to finish this lap guys, because it's about to be lap 100. finally had a chance to have a look at the clutch uh, that we pulled off in the night and uh, look at that it's completely shagged so I'm not sure if it's a mismatch of parts or if it was an install error what do you reckon look we just bought it as a complete unit in a sealed box and the thing is when we installed it, it was fine but when we put it in the car it just didn't feel right it was way too hard on the pedal and we just, it didn't take a normal adjustment so we fought it for 12 hours and subsequently we, we actually did a gearbox. So the thing is you can see, see how thick these fingers are on the clutch? Yeah. That is probably double or more the clamping pressure of what the standard clutch was. This is a standard part. This is not a standard part. Both put together caused this to break. Yeah. And us doing lap after lap, we, yeah. it just wasn't right from the start. Uh, in other news though, We've just done 100 laps. So Marty's out there now, we've just done 100. He's coming in, Isaac's gonna jump in next. Um, and then basically we're gonna run through everyone. I'm gonna go last if the car's still working. Uh, and we're gonna keep running through everybody, keep the car going out and keep chopping as many, uh, as many other little nuggets as we can. Absolutely. Thanks, bro. All right, let's go. Let's do it. That was awesome. I got my personal best. The 323, only two seconds off the pace. The clutch seemed to bed in. I think we're good. We take care of the car, but we'll just have some fun now. There's around five hours of racing left, and we intend to use every last second of it. So Isaac's jumping in for a session, and then we're gonna get everyone back in the car before the race is finished for another drive. There's our mates out there that helped us out. How good. Oh
boss. That's right. Fun space. Gearbox has changed. Head gasket. It's been a big, big night. It's rough. Almost no sleep. Um, a lot of these cars are still going. A lot of really impressive results. A lot of people are actually now camping out, though, in their pits because they don't have enough fuel, but they want to finish the race. So they're just, like, waiting now, and they'll send it for the end. If you don't get over the checkered flag, you're disqualified. So you could be 400 laps deep, which would mean that you were going to win. If you ran out of fuel now, that's it. So, um... We need to make sure we finish. Stace is out there now. Yep. Uh, and then if the car is still working, Marty will take over, do the last 20 minutes, take us over the line, and uh, the car just has to keep working. Daihatsu Cross everything you got. Cross it, Perodua, in this case. Perodua, Kalisa, Daihatsu. Cross all your bits. It's so good to see your face. final tyre change before we push on towards the end of the race. people. Someone just flew off behind me. The race leader was in front of me but slowed down because I think he ran out of fuel. 
it's just chaos. There's probably only a couple of laps left. Some people still sending it. That guy's lapped me already. Just absolutely chaotic. My voice is gone. I've had energy, I've had no sleep. But I'm loving it. It's so good. Like the ultimate track day, man. Just amazing. It's only a couple minutes left. Just gonna send it. You know the best bit about this? Is your teammates cheering you on. Dave, Ebony, Isaac, Ying, my best mate Moog. Man, Stacey and Julian just did so much to help us. Absolute legends, made it all possible. All because I saw a picture of some K-cars racing and said, we're gonna try that. And we did it in a nugget. It's not even a race car. It's a freaking car we bought off Facebook Marketplace with a roll cage bolted in it and some mods and a bit of Haltech gear to keep it in one piece. And it bought us the whole time. But it's doing it. Maybe one or two laps left, that's it. So stoked. Such an amazing track. Halfway up the world in a K car. What I think is great is that a show that started about do it yourself has evolved into this thing. Do it yourself, learn, do it with your mates. What an experience in the same car that started the show. So cool. I reckon if I push, I'll get right to the finish line at midday. Let's give it a go. One last blast up to the finish line. Come on. did it. We actually did it. And while there'd be no podiums this time round, the real win was spending 24 hours racing this little car with our mates on the other side of the world. And that is priceless. The final part of this event is an on-track safari where all the cars that finish can load up with their drivers and race team and do a full parade lap around Sepang. This has been an absolutely huge effort. And while sometimes I shake my head at the absurdity of driving cars around and around the same road all night, I realize it's less about the what and more about the why. Why push your skills, push your endurance and even your friendships? The answer is to grow. Grow your knowledge, grow your abilities and grow your bonds. Our car may have fought us, but we pushed through and we made it. We made it here to the finish line and that victory is so much sweeter for us than if we just bought the perfect car and won. Some people dream of supercars, blasting along the European Alpine roads as their ultimate automotive experience. But for us, a tiny little car is all we needed to ignite the adventure of a lifetime. 16 years ago, if someone had told me we'd be endurance racing one of the cheapest hatchbacks ever made with our mates around Sepang, I would never have believed them. But we did, and it all started with a Daihatsu on a driveway in suburban Sydney. 